donkeys and four outfits make their way. Wranglers, cows, and wagons doing 15 miles a day. But the challenge shines before them as the daytime turns to night. Which outfit eats their supper first and gets the best campsite? From the days of the 1800s all across the prairie lands To the racetracks of the modern day from Calgary to Cheyenne Well, the Old West has sure come alive with the running of the wagon race Wagon and pollution, hot cakes to high The first chuck wagons were adapted from surgeons' wagons used during the American Civil War. Texas drovers adapted the sturdy, wide-gauged wagon for use on trail drives. Emptied of bandages, surgical instruments, and medicine, the upright cupboard at the back was filled instead with cooking utensils, tin cups and plates, and the wagon's bed with enough staples to support a dozen men for months on the trail. The provisions included, of course, Plenty of coffee beans for the grinder. There were thousands of gallons of coffee ground, brewed, and sipped from 1865 to 1884 when drovers trailed over six million head of longhorns up from Texas along the fabled Sedalia and Chisholm trails to markets in Kansas or further north up the western trail to fatten on the rich hard grasses of Wyoming and Montana. A capable trail boss didn't push his cattle. He normally let the herd graze and drift along at a leisurely pace of 10 to 15 miles a day. The cat hand longhorns were supposed to gain weight on their way up north. And then you'd usually pick up and have an early breakfast and, and move, move till about 10 o'clock and then you'd settle down and let the cattle rest and water and usually move towards water and then rest and and fill up during the, the noon hour. It took about four hours during the day to fill them up, and then when it cooled off, we would move on again. Riders spent most of the day in the saddle, as well as doing a two-hour shift each night watching the herd. A 2,000-mile drive meant that men, horses, and longhorns could be on the trail for four to five months at a stretch. The cook was such a highly valued member of the crew, he earned a better wage than a top cowhand. After 16 to 18 hours in the saddle in wind, sun, or rain, day after day after day, the men developed wolfish appetites. There was no dieting, no calorie cutting, no cholesterol counts. Just to maintain already lean bodies, the men had to devour three big meals a day. The meals were, they were just put together. It was mostly just your normal meal, your meat and potatoes and bread. And... But the chuck wagon was more than just a place to eat and drink. A jacked up hind wheel and a long rope made a perfect windlass to help pull bogged animals from flood silted riverbeds. After a storm, men draped their damp shafts and slickers over the wagon pole to dry. And each night the cook angled the pole towards the North Star so the trail crew had a compass point on clouded or misty mornings. In the 1870s, the chuck wagon led cattle from the United States up onto the Western Canadian rangelands. One of the first big herds trailed north was for the Bar U Ranch and its manager, Fred Stimson. He made a deal with Lynch, who was a drover, to meet him in Helena. And they went to Lost River, Idaho and they bought about 3,000 head of cattle for $19 a head and uh, a bunch of horses. Trail boss Tom Lynch hired a young black cowhand named John Ware for the drive north to Alberta. Lynch supplied Ware with a decrepit horse and a shoddy rig. 
suitable for the lowly job of Nighthawk and Cook's helper. When John Ware finally decided to ask for a little better saddle and a little worse horse, the whole crew knew the consequences. They gathered around the wagon to watch as a saddle was strapped onto the meanest, rankest bronc in the remuda. Ware knew what was up as well. Quick as a cat, he sprang into the saddle, but the bronc was airborne before he had time to set his stirrups. The lanky Ware just clamped his long legs tight around the horse's girth. His seat barely shifted as he rode the toughest outlaw in camp to a chest-heaving standstill. John Ware had not only got himself a better horse and saddle, but he had gained the lasting respect of the men who followed the Bar U wagon. As it had in the United States, the chuck wagon became an integral part of the big Canadian roundups every year. In late spring, the cattle were gathered and the new calves for each ranch were branded. In the fall, men, horses, and wagons were sent out to gather the grass fat steers for market. These general roundups were well organized affairs with large ranches supplying complete wagons and crews, while smaller outfits sent one or two riders as reps. There were no fences to separate the different herds, just one vast open range. The 1885 Canadian Spring Roundup involved close to a hundred men, 500 horses, and over 20 wagons. The riders gathered 50,000 head of cattle off a range the size of Ireland. Pioneer rancher Fred Ings, a rep for his OH brand riding with the Bar U wagon, described the daily routine. When we were gathered together, the range boss would give us his orders for the day. He would allot portions of the country to different men who would work that park thoroughly, bringing all the cattle he found back to a common center near the wagon. They were called circle rides, and usually two were made a day. After the second gather was accomplished, the men would prepare the fires and the ground to work the latest bunch of cattle. As the Bar U cattle were the most numerous, they were cut out first from each day's drive, branded and turned loose, and then another and another brand would be worked out until all the calves in that bunch had been gone over. As the country was covered, and the wagons and the cattle moved gradually west, sometimes every day to a new site, but always with a thought to wood and water. There was enough demand for chuck wagons across North America that Studebaker designed a roundup model to sell through its catalog. They were built short so they could maneuver and get around. It was pretty well weighted down, and we had to have a four horse team on it. They had bed rolls wrapped in a, in, in a canvas sheet about 12 feet long and uh, six feet wide. And, and the blankets were inside. And, and when they moved the wagons, they, they folded the beds up and rolled them up and tied them with a straps or, or a, a bed rope and, and threw them in the, in the bed wagon. When setting up a new campsite, the bed wagon was parked so that a large rope corral could be anchored to the wagon's hind wheel. A special wrap on the wheel and hub made it easy to tighten the single strand of rope that circled and contained over a hundred horses. The uh, herders would run, run them in, into this corral and they'd rope them out. They'd get up before dark and, and uh, the, 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 the man that was roping the horses, he'd know the horse by, by the ears. That's about all you could see. Each rider needed five or six horses in his own personal string. The younger, less experienced mounts were used for the morning circle rides. A horse with plenty of cow sense was chosen to do the cut. And a rope-savvy horse helped lasso calves to brand. Because spring roundups occurred during flood season, 
Each man also had a favorite deep water horse, and no one wanted his mount to stumble and spook a herd of resting cattle, so each rider also had a sure-footed, reliable mount with which to share the lonely night shift. A young man's fancy might stray to romance, but a good-looking horse was never far from his mind either. In Log of a Cowboy, veteran drover Andy Adams stated, on the trail, an affection springs up between a man and his mount, which is almost human. Every privation which he endures, his horse endures with him. If the days were long for riders and their mounts, they were even longer for the chuck wagon cook. The pressure of early mornings and late nights was too much for a few of them. Their nicknames tell it all. Cooks like Dirty Dick, Old Poison Finley, or another fellow to avoid, known simply as Death on the Trail. But most were capable and respected men, and around the campfires of a big roundup, the exploits of a top-notch cook were as much a topic of conversation as a fine roper or a great cutting horse. Open-range cowboys all seemed to have a sweet tooth. They craved raisin pies and rice pudding variations like spotted dog and son of a gun in a sack. Sourdough recipes were popular too, as well as being a necessity in country where yeast was hard to come by. On frosty spring or fall nights, a cautious cook might even take his sourdough crock to bed with him to keep the precious mix from freezing. In Montana today, there are still batches of sourdough mix that can trace their lineage directly back to the 19th century Roundup camps. When the men were not out on the Roundup, they ate in the cookhouse, but often still slept outside with the wagon, away from the bedbugs. The men would come in with their loads of hay, and they'd throw off a bundle of hay to take into the bunkhouse. They'd put their tarpaulin over that with no beds. We'd sleep on this hay, and we raised the very best of bed bugs. Cow critters had to deal with bugs, too. Tiny mange mites burrowed under the skin, leaving infected cattle scabby or hairless. For a number of years, around the turn of the century, an extra general roundup was instituted to gather all the northern range cattle and herd them through a mange dip, a six-foot channel filled with a steaming hot potion of lime and sulfur. The foul-smelling mixture not only killed mange mites, but it tarnished metal buckles, buttons, and coins. And on at least one occasion, it tarnished a cook's temper. When Jack Morton came in late for supper, Roundup cook Louie Joe left the young cowhand with nothing to eat. Jack would have gone to bed hungry if another big man, John Ware, hadn't shared his plate. The next morning, Breakfast was late because Louie Joe's pants were missing. That evening, the irate cook accidentally spilled a hot coffee on Morton's lap. The affair could have continued to escalate, but Morton decided to postpone his revenge. It was after the boys had finished their final meal on the last day of dipping when Jack surveyed the cook. You have us worried with all the itching and scratching you've been doing, Louie Joe. We figure you must have contracted a case of the mange. With these words, Morton wrapped his powerful arms around Louis Joe and carried the frantically struggling cook over to the mange dip, where he unceremoniously dumped him into a sulfurous channel littered with hair and debris from thousands of head of cattle. As the sputtering cook climbed out, Morton commented, one dip should be enough to rid you of that itch. Mange mites and unhappy cooks were only a few of the problems ranchers had to face. By the turn of the century, railroad lines, irrigation ditches, and barbed wire fences were cutting the open range into smaller and smaller chunks. The fall of 1906 was especially hot and dry. Grass fires burned off sections of winter pasture and torched haystacks. The snow came early that winter, and it stayed, and temperatures dropped to record lows. Cattle, horses, and men suffered. The 
Those ranchers who still had hay doled out what little they had, but it wasn't enough. Across Western North America, open range ranches lost over 50% of their stock. Riding past the rotting corpses made the following spring's roundup a bitter affair. That gather of 1907 was the last general roundup in Canada. Well, here we are again today, risking our lives for very little pay, but it's a life we'll choose and it's a life we'll live. And Lord, we don't ask anyone to give. But we want to thank you, Lord, for the many trouble-free miles that we travel each year, up and down the highways and the dusty old roads, knowing that you're near. Now, we ain't always been straight or took a religious stand, but when we crawl up on the seat of that wagon and look back at the family, there's someone we truly believe in, and you're the man. And we turn them barrels, and she lifts up on two. I sometimes hear a little voice saying, Don't worry, son, I'm in here too. In the past, you've taken a few drivers, a few outriders, even the odd child or two. But really, Lord, no one has ever blamed you. So we don't ask that you take us to heaven or never run in stormy weather. But when it's all over and you gather since your mighty kingdom come, would you please keep us all together? <laughs> 